But Isaiah chapter 51, starting in verse 1, it says, Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the whole to the whole of the pit from which you were dug. So we look to Jesus, we stand on the rock, we listen, amen, and, and we look back and see, where has God brought us from? I don't know where you've come from. I was saved out of the muck and mire of sin at age five. Now how deep can that be? Well, it's just as deep as anybody else. Let me tell you, if you don't have Jesus, you're in sin. Amen. 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 Have you ever taken stock of your life and said, what's going on? What's happening? Where am I at? And said, maybe, you know what? I'm not where I think I should be. I'm not where I think God wants me to be. Or maybe you're satisfied. Or maybe you're not living the way you know you should. At, uh, when two of my sons, one was four, one was two, I went to a restaurant with the pastor I just started working for. He took us out to the meal after the first Sunday we had been there. We went out to Village Inn. I don't know if there's any more around anymore, but you know they're famous for their pies. And So took my, I was a green as green can be youth pastor and had my four-year-old, my two-year-old, and I don't know if you've ever seen toddlers. They can be toddling. And uh, I was trying to impress my new boss, my pastor, and the one was just all around. He was underneath the table all around. And, and I said, sit up here and act like a man. <laughs> Y'all have raised kids, haven't you? And thank the Lord, my wise pastor, who I just, you know, I'd interviewed with him, but really didn't know well. He said, how old is your son? I said, he's four. So you're asking him to act like a man, and he's four years old. <laughs> yes. So let the kid be a kid. Now that doesn't mean he runs all over the restaurant and does whatever he wants, but I was trying to impress him by having my kid act the way I thought he should. In fact, I actually made it look worse by trying to tell my four-year-old to act like an adult. So many times, we're n we try to impress all these other people when it's only God that we need to worry about. I taught middle school for many years and kids would do all kinds of things, get into trouble, change all kinds of hairstyles and all that, you know. Uh, most of the time it was to impress someone else. Why'd you act that way? And they really couldn't tell you, but what they were really saying was, I was trying to draw attention to them or trying to give them this club or whatever. There's no one to impress but him. Amen. 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 Because when all is done, I don't stand before anybody else. I stand before God and have to give an account for me. So if you're not where you think you should be with God, there's good news today. You can be there today. You can make it right today. The first verse, the first phrase of the verse says, listen. Listen to me. Who are we listening to? In chapter uh, 51, verse 4, it says, listen to me, my people. Hear me, my nation. Verse 7 says, Hear me, you know what is right. Listen to God. Who has your ear? Who are you listening to? So many were listening to all these other voices. We're reading all these other things. Here's the one we should read, and he's the one we should listen to. Amen? Amen. But have you ever jumped to conclusions without having all the information? Have you ever gotten just portions of it and you, you know, somebody tells you a story and you just go crazy? Well, I have a, a few examples. <clears throat> my, excuse me, my wife was, had started a teaching job. She had been there three weeks 
And she comes home and says, our, one of our sons in third grade got in trouble for vandalizing a textbook, and I've had to pay for this textbook. Wow. I said, well, show me what, what he did. And they said, well, he cut this textbook up, and I looked at the textbook, and I realized the pages that were cut were not cut with the little kid three third grade scissors that would just tear, but it was almost like a razor knife right through there. And as I flipped the pages of that book, it was a, the, the very center of the book, it was an extra set of pages. They were actually duplicates. So somebody had caught that and was aiming to cut it out but never finished the job. And the teacher, because my son, as he opened the book, and they're going through the book, new classroom, the teachers, you know, you walk the kids through the book so they sort of know. And he raised his hand, said, my book is cut, and the teacher blamed him, sent him to the office, got in trouble. In walks dad. I'm not happy. Because they took part of the information, saw a book, blamed my son, and wouldn't even listen. So I marched the next day the proud papa I am, I marched that book straight to the principal and let him have it. He didn't know because the assistant principal had done the discipline and he had never met me. He had only hired my wife three weeks ago. <laughs> I was still Christian, all right. <laughs> but I wasn't happy. My son was blamed because somebody jumped to a conclusion pointed out the error, they, that assistant principal never apologized to my son. Yeah. But I've forgiven her. She's gone on to her reward, whichever it is. I don't know. <laughs> it was her last semester and she was retiring and it's been quite a number of years ago. Anyway. But the principal walked to my wife and afterwards and said, I met your husband today. <laughs> Thank the Lord they're still friends. But that's jumping to conclusions. I have another example. One of my sons, I have four boys, by the way, so they, they figure out who it is, but you don't know who it is. My 16-year-old son comes and says, Dad, uh, something's wrong with this tire. It's off the rim. And there were, he had put the spare on, and I looked at this tire, and it just didn't look right. But I, I said, okay, I'll fix it. I took it down. The, they put it back on the rim, and we were having dinner, and his girlfriend came over, and she happened to slip up and let us know that he was out doing donuts with his buddies. Not the same boy, just saying, okay. And not only that, but the police were called, and he had gotten a warning ticket. The Lord helped that boy, because I took the information he gave me at face value that, oh, it was just a problem, I hit a curb, I can't remember his story, but the real story, that boy was grounded for a long time. But we can't jump to conclusions. We need the whole truth. We need to listen to the voice that we need to listen to. We can get all this other information. There's no website to go out there to find all the right information. We have to seek it out ourselves. Not. We have to know the truth. They tell me that when they train Bible tellers, it's probably not true anymore with all the technology, but they used to put them in a, a room and have them count the money. And they would slip in a fake every now and then. And by counting real money for so long, their hands could notice the change in that paper. Their eyes could notice the change in, in the counterfeit. And it would train those tellers what's real and what's fake. We have been given the opportunity to count and to know the truth. The Bible says you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Because what does the enemy want to do? He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to distract us. He wants to keep our focus off of him and on all this other stuff, on everything else that's going on around us. 
and we lose focus. As my son mentioned, he didn't know what I was preaching today, but about the perspective of that lanyard and that car in the distance, that is exactly what the enemy wants to do. We focus on what's right there, but he wants us to focus on him. There's a song out by a popular artist. Her name is Megan Trainer, and I only know this because I taught middle school. But it says, I know you're lying because your lips are moving. <laughs> That's the enemy. If he's talking, he's lying. He wraps a little truth around it. He, he'll twist it. He'll make all kinds of... Where do we find the truth? We find it in him, in Jesus Christ. So listen up and know the truth. The second thing is we need to look up. Verse 1 again. Listen to me, you who follow Jesus. You who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn. Look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 is that reference. Colossians 3, 2 says, Set your mind on things above. When trouble hits, when problems come, where do we look? So many times when we see a difficulty or problem, that's all we see. But there's a song out there on Christian radio today that says, Look up, child. Look up. There's an old song that says, Look up, your redemption draweth nigh. Look up and look at Jesus. Look at Him. Our focus should be on Him. Yes, we deal with all these issues, all these problems, but there's something greater, and His name is Jesus. In Psalms, it says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains, to the hills, where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Peter and John go into the gate beautiful. The guy sitting by the gate was begging alms, and they, Peter and John said, look at us. In other words, he's probably down there just... Have you ever seen somebody beg like that? They just hold, hold it up. They don't want to make eye contact with you. They're just... He says, look up. Look at us. Why? Not because we're going to give you a little bit. We don't have any money. But there's someone greater. Someone that'll not just help you in this problem. He's going to lift you up out of that problem. They said, focus on us. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. In the name of, speak that name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. So for, if you're in a place of pain, despair, difficulty, look up. He is here. The enemy wants to just keep you right there right there in that pain and suffering. Some people wear it as a badge of courage. I mean, I've shared a couple stories. I could share all kinds of stories of things I've gone through, problems I've had, difficulties. But I can't let that define my life. I can't let that be all I am. And every time somebody sees me, all we do is talk about that. I have to let Jesus be my King and my Lord. Our witnessing to other people is simply telling others, what has Jesus done for me? He's pulled me up out of the pit. He's pulled me up out of the problems. He's kept me from having to beg. And He's set me free. free. He's set my feet upon the rock. So we need to look up. Number three, we need to wake up. Verse nine, Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord, awake as in the ancient days and the generations of old. Remember when you were so on fire for God, nobody could stop you. I remember when I was so hungry for God, we would lay around the altar and seek God and go after Him. You know, I've, we get a little older, we get a little more, eh, I don't know about, maybe, maybe just me, okay. Are we as passionate for God as we need to be? Are we as hungry for God? What are we feasting on? What are we eating? What are we filling ourselves with? 
if you're pouring in what others are saying rather than what Jesus is saying, and they could be, uh, let me just say it this way. I need to know the truth for myself. I just can't receive it while somebody else is interpreted Amen. for me. Yes. I have to know the truth. One of the things that some of the old, old line uh, religious organizations, let's just say, they want to limit who reads the truth. Yeah. They want to regulate it yeah. to the minister, to the priest, to the religious folks. But he has come that I might have life, and so I can read it for myself. That's why we have it in so many different versions, so many different languages. You can't take your English word Bible to China, and unless they can read English, it doesn't help them at all. They have to read a Chinese Bible. Yes. We need it in our own language. I'm, well, let me just move on. Wake up. How many of us today can say, I'm more passionate about living for God than ever before in my life? Sadly, most of us would say that happened a while ago. Many are in a place of comfort, complacency, or a spiritual sabbatical. That's just a fancy word. I have it. Vacation. We have, I am older, <laughs> I was going to tell you my age. I've done, done a lot for God. I've worked a lot for God. There are times that just kick up your feet, I'm just tired. Have you ever, don't raise your hand, but have you ever been tired? You're just wore out. It's, it's work. It's work, and you have... I work full-time at the church now, but before I was part-time, I would teach school, raise a family, work at church, do the ministry there. It, it, it will wear you out. And we get so overwhelmed, and there are times we just say, you know what, let me just, I'm going to kick my feet up and relax. And some of you are at that place, and that's where you need to be. But some of us, we've kicked back a little too long. We need to get out of our comfort zone. Why? We say many, let, let others do the work. We've paid our dues. They need, their, they need their chance to sweep the floor, stack chairs. We fill in the blank. But many times we say, let others pray for us. Let others fight for us. As we sang, Jesus for my family, I'm reminded of my dad praying for us. I had two brothers praying for us boys. I'd walk by his room and you could hear him in that bedroom crying out our names. And you know how hard it is to disobey and to be ornery when your dad's in there praying to God and calling your name out. It's tough. It's tough because, like, oh man, God's going to get me. You know. But I can't let others pray for my kids and my family. I need to get on my knees and pray for my kids, Amen. my family. I can't regulate that to someone else. And I have to teach them and train them. They need to pray for their kids and their family, although I pray hard for my grandkids too. What I'm saying is we, there's a battle we face, and we have to face it. We've got to stand and do what's right. Wake up from our spiritual slumber. Satan wants to put us to sleep. He wants us to relax. Oh, you, the, the worst place to be is right after a victory because we just sort of... Maybe we get complacent. Maybe we get... We just sort of settle in. We got to stay alert. Stay, stay in tune with God. So what is at risk? When we are not engaged in fighting the good fight... We allow the enemy to advance and gain footholds on territory that, that isn't his. Satan has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came that we might have life. In 1 Chronicles eleven twelve, there's a story of Eliezer, son of Dodai, or some versions say Dodo. I'm, I'm not the Dodo bird, but... 
He was one of the mighty men of David. You ever heard of the mighty men of David? David, uh, in this chapter, goes through just a few of them and what great things they did. And this one here was, was more that story of waking up and taking charge. It says, He was with David at Pos de Mim when the Philistines gathered there for battle at a place where there was a field full of barley. The troops fled from the Philistines. The guys he was fighting with ran off, but he, they took their stand in the middle of the field and they defended it and struck the Philistines down. And the Lord brought about a great victory. Basically he said, I'm not leaving. I'm not going to run and hide. I'm going to stand and fight. When the enemy comes in, when the problems arise, when difficulties come, it's time to just stand your ground and pray. And pray. I like the last part of that verse. It says, And the Lord brought about a great victory. The Lord brought about a great victory. It wasn't that he brought, the, Eliezer did the job. He's saying the Lord brought about a great victory. God was able to move. When we stand, he stands with us. It's not just us by ourselves. Satan will tell you, you're the only one standing. You're the only one that cares. You're the only one that wants to do it. No, God is with us and he will bring the victory and he gets the glory. It's all about him. It's not about us. Amen. It's all about God. Many of us here have a field that we need to protect. We're defending or taking back. When we wake up, we give God the opportunity to bring about a great victory. There are problems and issues that arise in our life, and we've got to take a stand, say no more. Not another step, Satan. Not another, uh, no more. No more. God is able. Now this is where faith has to arise in us. Because so many times we see everything around us. Peter stepped out in the water and said, Lord, if you bid me, I'll walk out there with you. And Jesus said, come on. But he started looking at all the waves. He started looking at all the difficulties. When we're standing, it's hard not to see all the difficulties. We say, Lord, where in the world are you? What are you going to do? How are you going to get me out of this problem? How are you going to solve this? Lord, you're, he is, but he is able. If we stand, he will stand with us. He said he would never leave us nor forsake us. He's not going to bring us to a point. He's not going to say, come to this edge and not be with me. He's going to be there with you all the way. God's not a God that he should lie. And he doesn't. His word is truth. He is able to deliver you. He is able. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Increase my faith. Encourage and bless, Lord God. Wake up. We got to, we just, we got to get, uh, let's get home from vacation. All right. <laughs> let's get off our spiritual vacation, our spiritual sabbatical and say, okay, God, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. Here's the biggest place you can make a difference in the kingdom of God. And that is talk to your neighbor. Yes. Be a witness to everybody you come in contact with. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean you got to just blast them with the word and tell them how bad they are. You share Jesus with them and you pray and say, "God, give me opportunity to speak into their life." When I taught school, I taught middle school, the first thing I did was learn those kids' names. My goal was by the end of the second day, because classes would come through, I'd have 150 kids to know every one of those kids by name. And I'd probably miss about four or five. And usually if I missed them up the first couple days, I'd mess them up the rest of the year. But, but I would make it a point. That way I could start speaking into their life because I, I knew them. Now, I didn't preach at them and but they knew before they left my class after a week with me that I cared about them, that I knew their name, and they knew I worked at church because I'd tell them, listen, I, I couldn't legally witness to them because it's public school.
but I would share, and thankfully I taught world history, which allowed me to talk about all the different religions of the world, and they got a lot more dose of Christianity than anything else, I will tell you that. <laughs> and thankfully my principal, her husband was a Baptist pastor, and so, but, and I'd pray over those chairs. Those kids didn't know they were sitting in anointed chairs. Amen. Lord, when they, and when they would have problems, they would come. How do you witness to them? I see them now. I can't remember their names now. They'll see me. I have grandkids that, you know, help me, Jesus. They want me to remember their name from sixth grade in 1998. I can't do that. Witness to your neighbor. You don't have to memorize a bunch of scripture. You need to tell them what Jesus has done for you how he's changed your life, how he's made a difference in you. And if he hasn't made a difference, then you need to be down at the altar and say, Lord, make a difference in me. Because I need a testimony. A testimony doesn't mean this is how bad I was, this is how good I am. The testimony says, I was lost in sin. Jesus has set me free. And now I have peace. Now I have something to live for beyond what this world has to offer. The last thing... Stand up. Verse 17 says, Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who, who have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. You have drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling and drained it out. There is no one to guide her among the sons she has brought forth, nor is there any who takes her by the hand among all the sons she has brought up. In other words, you've got to look to God. You've got to stand up for God. Get out of what you're in. If sin were something that was valuable, people would, they wouldn't have to change, but they want to change all the time because it's miserable. Sin is only good for a season, only fun. Then it drives, it drives us to a place where we don't want to be. There's no peace without God. There is no I can't describe, there's, there's no joy without the presence of God Amen. in your life. We see so much trouble and difficulty and people go, run to all these things the world has to offer. They run to uh, whatever, whatever vice, whatever, they, they run to entertainment, they run to all these things. Nothing satisfies that emptiness in our soul, but Jesus Christ. Nothing. So rise up. We can't sit back anymore. We can't relax and let life go by. And the older I get, the less I have left, so I gotta get, get all I can. Moms and dads, let's take the lead in our families and with our kids to not only tell them we love Jesus, but show them with our lives. The worst testimony you can ever be is say one thing and do another. Tell your kids how great God is and not live for Him in front of them. I pray and it's, I pray that we live for Him, that we, we not only tell them, but we show them with our life. When difficulties tr rise up, when problems arise, where do I turn? What do my kids see me do? Now all of them, but one are gone and out of the house. And one in June, thank the Lord, will tie the knot and he'll be gone too. <laughs> He's not watching. He just left. But I, they need to know that I'm the same person behind this pulpit as I am on my couch at my house or in my lazy boy. I'm not saying one thing to one person and living another. When we do that, our, we're in trouble. I don't need to go any further. All right, grandparents. I are one, okay? I am from West Virginia, by the way. So we're allowed to say it that way. Our grandkids can learn so much about serving God in the hard times by sharing our experiences and love for Jesus. I remember talking with my 
mom's dad. He was a hard-working farmer in, uh, I'm going to try to say this word, rural Virginia, R-U-R-A-L. I have a hard time with that, being from West Virginia myself. He's a farmer, and he had a skin condition that the sun would irritate his skin so bad, we'd call it eczema today, but he would take his, he, he would just, okay, uh, he would scratch all the time. Let's just say it that way. This man worked hard, but he would sit in that rocking chair, pull out his banjo, and sing songs about Jesus. Now, you think that's a cliche, but he had a banjo, and he played pretty good. He loved Jesus. He didn't, TV came around, he was born in the early 20s. TV hadn't really been a big thing in his life, but a rocking chair and some songs, and he would read his Bible before he'd go to bed and read it to all us grandkids. Worst beating I ever got in my life was from him, by the way. You say, Pastor Greg, you're so, you're so good. He was a deacon at his church, a Pentecostal Holiness Church in Virginia. And I had an older brother. Well, oh boy, I just gave it away. Then. Uh, he's now the president of Evangel College, but... Evangel, uh, and an uncle that was a year older than him. And I don't know what happened. We were in church on the back row. Big mistake, but anyway... <laughs> My grandfather was up on the second row like he always was, deacon of the church, and we got tickled for something. We started giggling. And you know how you get going and you can't stop. If I'd have known what was coming later, I'd have stopped. <laughs> but me and my brother spending the weekend with my uncle, we were real, still real close. And we couldn't stop. The pastor called us down from the pulpit. It was bad that we were doing this. Worse that he stopped his sermon to get on to us. The worst beaten. And I got, I was the youngest, so I got the least amount. My uncle got the worst. My brother was next. But he lived it. I didn't like it. I deserved it. But he loved me enough. Now today they would say something bad, but anyway. He loved me enough to discipline me. Yes. Loving people isn't just, oh, we're all hugs and kisses. It's setting boundaries and holding to those boundaries and saying, this is the line, don't cross it. Here's what happens if you do. Doesn't have to be angry, mean, and screaming and yelling. It's just this is what it is. One of my sons uh, was not getting good enough grades. He just got an iPad for Christmas, or a, an iPod, one of those that had music on it, okay, uh, dating myself again. And uh, his report card came back right before the Christmas break. He wasn't doing right. He straight A student, but wasn't turning in his work. He could take the test, not take a note, just drive teachers crazy. But his grades were bad. We said, you're not getting, your, here's your gift. You get it for Christmas Day. We take it back because you're grounded until those grades come up. We kept that thing six months. That poor kid did not have that because he, he finally, it dawned on him, I better do my work. It took him six months to figure it out. But you know how teenagers are. They're a little hard-headed. We loved him enough. He remembers that today, and he's reminded again as he watches this later. God loves you. God cares for you. He wants us to stand up and live for him and do what's right. If we're not in line with what he desires, we need to just get in line. Why? It's not because well, what others are going to think of me. What does my God think of me? We need to stand for God in our homes, our neighborhoods, our towns, our counties, city, state, nation, our world. It's not some political cause that we stand for. It's the name of Jesus. That name that is above every name. That at that name every knee will bow, every tongue confess. We're